managerial farewells, yet more England squad chat, and perhaps the earliest look at the 2024-25 Premier League season odds. All that and more on today's show. Hello and welcome to the Betting Expert Football Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Jenkins, joined as ever by Betting Experts Football Editor, Sam Ingram. How are we doing, Sam? Hello, Dan. Yeah, not too bad. Um, I'm on the back of a stag do right. in Krakow on the weekend, so maybe nice lacking a bit of match sharpness, but I'm here and I'm, I'm ready to give it a good go, so... Not quite on the beach this time of se- this time of the season, but no, uh, may- maybe just coming back from the beach and kind of feeling my way into a bit of fitness. But yeah, <laughs> give it a good go. You won't be the only one connected with football to be feeling that way at this moment. I don't think. <laughs> so, format-wise, I mean, we've been doing it a while, but just to explain to people, new listeners, perhaps, we are going to go through some of the week's most interesting stories, the, the nonsensical. I think is probably the theme we t- try to touch on as much as possible. There will be some betting angles, but most likely there probably won't be. So uh, it's yeah, it's just interesting things that we've picked up over the last couple of days and over the last week. So Sam, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I'll kick us off. Um, should we start with probably wise to start with the the England squad, isn't it? That was announced. the The training squad, the thirty three man squad, was announced yesterday. Yeah. And my main takeaway was that. Well, myself and I suppose a lot of other England fans have been calling on Southgate to shuffle the pack for years and years, like desperate for him to sidestep away from his favourites and go for form, go go with the form options at his disposal rather than like, instead of his favourites. And in this 33, one that's going to be cut down to 26, I think he's done it. His... His hand's probably been forced because we've got a wealth of players in really good form for their clubs. But in the past, there's a select few, yeah, Southgate's favourites who were undroppable. And I think Henderson's a standout from that, as is Rashford. And probably a little further down the list, you've got Calvin Phillips, Eric Dyer, Sterling, Ben Chilwell misses out too. Um, so I think that's probably my main takeaway that he really has shuffled the pack and now it's one that's packed with a little bit of inexperience maybe, but also what comes with that is, is fearlessness in abundance. And I think that's what you need at, um, major tournaments, but I'm talking of inexperience, you look at that team and I think there's still plenty of it in camp because if you look down that spine, especially Pickford, Stones, Maguire, Rice, Harry Kane, that's precisely what you want running down the middle of your national side. So if you're a Manu, a Wharton, Eze, Gordon, etc., that's what you that's what you're gonna to want to look across and see those guys down the spine. So I think we've got enough experience in there. We've got enough fearlessness in there to to really um give it a good go. And like I always do, whenever every major tournament rolls around them, I'm, I'm getting a little bit a little bit excited, uh, probably going to be let down. But yeah, that's that's yeah. kind of my main takeaways to begin with. Yeah, usually we'll be let down. And as always with this kind of thing, you've been waiting for, for Southgate to do it and now he's done it and it's infuriating that he's done it and he's actually got some new players in. We started to question, look, look maybe, oh, maybe there's not enough experience in this. I think a lot of them will be cut as they often do at this time. They'll bring in a few younger players. I'm looking at players like Kwanzaa who's come in Adam Morton, maybe as a, they like to bring them into the squad, into the extended training squad a little bit earlier. They're mm-hmm. not going to make the official squad. They're not going to get on the plane or on the train as it sometimes is. They just want them to have that experience of linking up with the squad of training at St. George's and just being around the rest of the guys, giving them some of that tournament experience. So there are a few in there. I mean, I, I was quite surprised not to see Marcus Rashford. Yeah, I mean that's the one for me, Dan. That was that was touch and go, like because in an England shirt, he's not been great this season. He hasn't, but in an England shirt, I like him in the squad. Like you kind of you know what you're getting from him. He usually steps up for England. He's explosive off that left, and that's probably an area where we're lacking. We've got Anthony Gordon, 
who I think probably should start for England at the Euros on the left, seeing Rashford's not there. I think you've got Anthony Gordon. And then after him, I don't know if you've got like a natural left-sided player that's that's really ready to come in and make an impact at an international level. I know Eze's in the squad or in, in the in the 33, but I'm not sure if he takes him or not. And he's not an out-and-out out left winger. He kind of likes to drift centrally and, and impact the game in central areas too, in between the lines. So I probably have taken Rashford. But at the same time, if you're picking your squad, how Southgate has done so here, then... I'm not overly surprised he misses out, but yeah, that was the that was the one for me that I was a little bit surprised about. I think, yeah, he'd probably be in contention to start for me because I just think he provides the most balance with him, Kane and Saka in that front three. But I mean, as we've often seen with England squads in the past, it's difficult to get everyone in, and when you try to get everyone in, you leave a really unbalanced team, which I think a lot of international, especially England sides, have done in the past. They've just got all their best players in, yeah, and they're left that, with a, you know, an international team which just doesn't work. Yeah, no, I agree, and I think the key for me in this squad, especially in attacking areas, because like you said, we've got we've got a lot of players fighting for those three positions. Or you, you won't count four because Kane's nailed on, but yeah, you've, you've got a lot of lads there fighting for uh, a starting berth. And the key for me is to get Foden playing centrally. Like, don't want to see him on the left. That's why I say Gordon, for me, has to start on the left because that means Foden's centrally. Saka on the right, I think usually what happens as an England team is we come up against a lot of low blocks, especially against the lesser nations, of course, where they flood central areas. And like You need your wingers. You need, you need players that are capable and feel comfortable to be pushing right out to that byline to, you know, to... to, to um, to get at their fullbacks and create a bit of space and get a ball in or hit the ball and whatever it may be. We need those wingers. So I think Gordon has to start, but yeah, got to get Foden playing centrally where he likes it best because he's been one of the best players in the world. So you cannot shoehorn him out left or out right. That's not going to, that's not going to work for me anyway. So that's the main thing. Um, yeah, I have Kane, Saka, Foden, Gordon starting in that front four. Rice and Bellingham in behind, I think. And I think I'm really happy with that. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably force Foden out wide, probably put Bellingham a little bit further forward, let Rice and someone else sit. But but then I think, yeah, well, maybe. I mean, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. And we've not even mentioned Palmer either, by the way. But yeah. I just think if you have Palmer and Foden out on the left, I just think they're going to drift centrally. And if you've got Harry Kane dropping deep too, I don't know. I don't think there's that right. You mentioned it a minute ago. I don't think there's that right balance there. And you want your best players in their best position. So I just think Foden has to be central. But yeah, it's going to be interesting how Gareth goes with it. Yeah, definitely. Shall we move on to the other big story of the week, which is Mauricio Pochettino's departure from Chelsea. So uh, according to reports from Matt Law in The Telegraph, the Chelsea leadership came armed, and in quotes, armed with data showing season-long inconsistencies and weaknesses, including big chances missed and a failure to make set pieces count, according to Ben Jacobs. Uh, how can you give a manager, Nicholas Jackson, Mikhailo Mudrik, and an injured Christopher Nkunku, and expect prolific goal scoring? Sam, that's my question to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I mean... Well, my question to you is like, what do they expect? Like genuinely, like what did they expect from this season? What was the what was the expectation for Pochettino in this Chelsea side? Was it to well, it must have been to to get Champions League football then? I mean, which feels they got European football. They finished with twenty points more than last season. I think. Yeah, fin well, finished twelfth last season. So obviously, you know that it was the worst season at that football club for, for God knows how many years, a horrendous campaign. So he's gone from 12 to six, but that was, you, you know, you thought that would probably happen because they were that bad last season. Yeah. So that was expected, but I don't think the ownership could really expect him to, to get much more out of this Chelsea team. And, you know, a bloated young squad 
and they really struggled for periods, especially at the start of the season, moving into the middle of the season. They really struggled. Um, there were tricky periods where, you know, they were losing games they shouldn't. Obviously, the ownership's not going to be happy with that. But we've got to realise that there's been so much change at that football club. Playing staff, coaching staff, managerial changes, and also in the boardroom too. Like that club must be unrecognisable for what was there like five years ago. Like, for example, if Diego Costa, random example, went back to Cobham now for a flying visit, <laughs> he'd probably feel like a fish out of water. Maybe there'd be like a chef or two knocking about. So for a new manager to come into that football club with like everything up in the air, relationships not formed between playing staff, coaching staff, etc. It's just such an uphill battle. And this ownership is one that came in, got rid of Thomas Tuchel after a pretty impressive spell at Chelsea, to say the least, because he probably wouldn't fall in line. He probably wasn't the type of manager that they could, you know, mould into the exact type of manager that they wanted in charge. Fair enough, you know, it's their club. But then they go and get a Graham Potter, who probably was that kind of manager, who was happy to not have a say in transfers and just to get on with it and be, you know... Just coach. Yeah, just coach, exactly. Um, and then they didn't like that. So what, they go back to... <laughs> they go back to a, a Pochettino, a man with experience, working with the type of personnel that they've got in their new squad that they've just rounded up and put all in one team. A man that knows how to work with the younger players. And he starts to do quite well after a while, considering he's been tasked, you know, with whipping up this kind of squad. And my point here really is, like, this could really hurt Chelsea. And it, it's it's difficult not to delve into the situation much further because we don't know who else is coming in. But it just feels a bit daft, to be honest. And managers need time. They're not miracle workers. Like, this is not a magic show. This is, you know... This is hard work. So I just feel like they were starting to turn a corner and this could well just be one step forward, two steps back. I was pretty surprised, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's probably my feelings on it. It's completely one step forward, two steps back. They were making progress, especially towards the last you know, last three months of the season. They were looking, they started to click. And I keep coming back to the Thomas Tuchel departure a couple of years ago when he was wanting more influence in transfer dealings, but the board wanted to take over complete control of it. And as we've seen with Chelsea's transfer business in the past 18 months, it's been pr probably longer than that. I think going back to the Lukaku summer a few years ago, Chelsea's transfer business has been the worst in the Premier League. Mm. The worst up there with the worst in European football. They're awful at it. All over the shop. Absolutely disastrous. But... You know, maybe Mitch Pochettino wanted a bit more involvement in that. Hasn't worked out. And yeah, probably for the best for Pochettino personally to get out of that club. But yeah, where did it go next? Where does Pochettino go next? Bayern? United? Maybe. Well, there's a few there's a few clubs looking for managers. I don't think Manchester United could, could go too far wrong with Pochettino. They like got a young, for a while. Yeah, yeah, they have. They've got a younger squad. He's obviously got experience of Premier League football. I'm guessing he'd like to get straight back into management. You know, he's only been in post for what, a year and a bit. So, yeah, United maybe. Just following Mourinho around, isn't he? So, last couple of weeks, I've been keeping a notes app on my phone, Sam, <clears> listing <throat> every single manager who's been linked with the Bayern job. <laughs> okay. So... I'm just going to read Long old right. list. It's a long list. So, <laughs> Mauricio Pochettino joins Vincent Company, Roger Schmidt, Roberto De Zerbi, Hansi Flick, Ralph Rangnick, Oliver Glasner, Eric Ten Hag, Stefan Kuntz, Pep Guardiola, Julian Lopetegui, Zinedine Zidane, Julian Nagelsmann, and Unai Emery as being linked <laughs> with the role. Good company. Yeah, and that's that's a bit. It's a bit feels a bit crazy for me because when I think of Bayern Munich, like. Well, not not recently, but bef before this kind of mar managerial search, it's always been the case of like they do their business behind doors. 
no leaks. They're efficient, like a proper German club. Yeah. E- efficient, straight to the point. They get their targets because, you know, it's Bayern Munich. And this just feels like, to be honest, I'm not clued up with like what, what goes on behind the scenes there. I don't know who's left or, or whatever. But yeah, it feels very unlike Bayern Munich. And some of the names there, really quite interesting. Like Vincent Company, like that, that's one that springs out to me. I think I'd like to, I think I'd like to see it. And I don't know if that's just because like, I loved him as a player and I think he was brilliant last season in the championship. His Burnley team was brilliant, but that's a bit of a jump from the championship to the champions league. So I don't know if it would work out, but I think I'd like to, to see him take a role like that. It would be interesting. Speaking of Burnley, saw a tweet this week about a winning bet from uh, Twitter user Carly. Uh, had over 0.5 goals in every Burnley, Luton and Sheffield United Premier League fixture this season. So no nil-nil draws for any of the newly promoted teams. Odds of 150 to 1 at the start of the season. And it came in, which was amazing. I mean, picked a good time for it. The most goals ever scored in the Premier League season. Perfect timing. Yeah. So I was looking back at how sort of common this was. And there were five teams that didn't have a nil-nil draw this season. The other two were Spurs and Newcastle. Last season, there were only three, West Ham, mm-hmm. City and Spurs. The season before, there were only two, Newcastle, Liverpool. The season before, there, were only, there was only one back in 2020, 2021, Sheffield See, United. That's the, the things with, with bets like this. Like That was obviously like a special or something, a whatever yeah, bookmaker. Yeah, and, and you look at it and you think... It's not bad that that's not, I can see that happening, but very rarely do they come in. There's always one game that's you know like a drab Wednesday night in December or something where just neither team's up for it. Um, so yeah, I'd probably want a bit more than 150 to one, but fair play, <laughs> you know, like they've won it, so good on them. Fair play, fair play. So next up, I've got Jurgen Klopp's farewell. It's probably another another big story over the, the final day weekend. It was obviously an end of an era at Anfield. And it was one that reportedly averaged a 70% higher TV average audience in comparison to Man City's title celebrations. So I'm just bringing you facts. So I don't know what that... I don't know what that means. I don't know if, you know, people aren't interested in Man City's success. Or I have no wonder why that could be. Um, but it seems many, many more people were interested in Klopp leaving Liverpool. Um, and did you see Jurgen Klopp starting a, an Arnie slot champ? I did. At Anfield after the yeah. game. Yeah, fair play. Yeah, I, thought, I, thought that was, I thought that was a really nice touch, you know, and so like, it's a passing of the torch, isn't it? And it's something we rarely get to see from departing managers because usually they don't go on their own terms. And if they do, it's unlikely that it's announced before the season and it's unlikely that it's announced before a new manager is waiting in the in the wing. So I can't remember. Well, I've definitely not seen another manager chant. Last one I can remember that's anything similar was when Sir Alex Ferguson left United and David Moyes had already been announced and he was saying in his farewell address to support the new manager... But yeah. he, it's it's not really it's not very Fergie to start chanting with the fans. I wasn't expecting like <laughs> a more easy chant from Fergie. Yeah. No, that that's fair enough. Um but yeah, I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was Klopp all over. And we also saw Van Dyke and Trent crying at the end of the game. And I, I kind of get that, you know, he's like a he's a father figure. And we also saw Pep Guardiola crying in, in a press conference. <laughs> uh, he started tearing up, which I don't he's get. He's a weird bloke, isn't he? <laughs> he he's, he's a sensitive guy, obviously. Like, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'd have been crying in this position, but hey, like, it's fine to cry. So, did you also see, I saw on, on I think it was Twitter or Instagram or something, Dejan Lovren's post about Klopp leaving. Obviously, he was there for him for, with Klopp for a while and, won the Champions League with him, won a few trophies with him. And he he said, and I think it it kind of really paints the picture of what Klopp's like as a bloke. So I wanted to read it out. He said, you you showed me the way how to get up when everyone beats you up. You showed me the way when nobody is believing in you, how to believe in yourself. You showed me the way how to be a man in difficult times. So that just, it just screams to me that, like I said, these players really see him as like a father figure. And, Klopp like clearly gets down 
with his players in the trenches and shares bits of his own personal life and battles with them. And like his man management skills are, are second to none because of like how real he is for them and because of how genuine his feelings are for his players. And yeah, he's going to be devastatingly missed at that football club from top to bottom, boardroom to playing staff to kitchen staff to whatever. Um, he's going to be sorely missed in Premier League football as well, but I'm sure there's also going to be a lot of people thrilled to see the back of him too. So, um, yeah, for me, I'm, I'm going to miss him in the Premier League for sure. Yeah, it could be one person in the first team squad at Liverpool who could be pleased to see the back of him. Did you see the players giving him a guard of honour and there was every single player and coach, member of the coaching staff applauding apart from Darwin Nunez? Uh, yeah, that's, I actually didn't see that, but um, that's crazy. Not not ideal. No, Something's gone on there. He's been one of the Must greats, have. hasn't he, in the Premier League club and... Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Liverpool get on without him. We've already, I mean, the season finished, what, 65 hours ago at the time of recording. So we're already looking at next season now on the yeah. on the podcast. Liverpool currently at 9.0 odds to win the title mm-hmm. next season. What do you think of that? Or what do you think of any of the, the outright odds? We're looking at City 2.3, Arsenal 3.75, Liverpool at 9. Yeah, yeah. Um... I think Arsenal's going to be right up there again. It's not the most outlandish claim, but I think they're going to be pushing City hard again. If I was to have a bet now, before the season started, before we've we've looked at the transfer window, etc., it'd just be on City at two point three. A um, really boring answer, but yeah, you know, it's it's difficult to back against them. And in terms of Liverpool, I think you kind of. Oh, you're shooting in the dark there a little bit because we really don't know how that transition is going to go. And I wouldn't be be backing them with with any kind of, any real kind of confidence against the likes of of Man City and, and Arsenal. But I suppose that's factored in the price, you know, um, nine to, was it nine to one or 9.0? 9.0. Yeah, it's a fairly big price. So look, if you, if you wanted a bigger price, then I suppose that'd be perfect for you. But the the standout price for me, was in the in the relegation odd stand. Have you seen um, Liverpool and Arsenal at two thousand to one? Are you going to be seen? bringing up the other team that finished in the top three odds? Yeah. For so Liverpool and Arsenal at two thousand to one to be relegated next season probably would stay clear of that. Probably not worth your time. Um, and then you got Manchester City at twenty five to one. So that's interesting. So the bookies are hedging their bets just in case City get the book thrown at them. Um, I just wish there was a bookmaker out there that had the self-confidence to put the odds at 125 to one. Yeah. Just, it's right there. Come on. The joke is that. I'll, t- I'll probably take it as well. Just do it. Just do it. One eye catching one for me. I mean, it's, it's come in a little bit, but when I was looking yesterday, Ipswich to get relegated was out at just above evens. Okay. Which is quite tempting considering the Kieran McKenna links. He's been linked with the Chelsea job, linked with the United job, linked with the Brighton job as well. It's coming down to about 1.91, which is still pretty good. But yeah, what do you think of that one? I think if he goes, then yeah, they're gonna have they're gonna have a really tough time. Um do you think he leaves Ipswich? Like he's just he just dragged that club up from, you know, League One Championship back to back, and now he's in the Premier League with with the same squad. He's gonna get a bit of funding, not as much as he get at Brighton, etc. Obviously, but wouldn't you just stay and have a go? Because it was a bit like the the Stephen Schumacher situation at Plymouth last year. Like if he would have stayed at Plymouth and just kept them in the league, like that's such an achievement. So it's a bit different, obviously, in the Premier League, but. If he gives it a real good go, plays the same brand of football and keeps them up, which I think he's got in him, then he's going to have to pick up all jobs. And then he's got a, a season of Premier League experience under his belt too. I just feel like, why would you Why would you be in a rush? You're obviously a brilliant manager. I don't, I don't know how old he is. He looks about 30. So 
yeah, don't be in a rush, you know, give it a year or two, stay at Ipswich, hone your craft a little bit more and then take one of the big jobs. That's what I'd do. But yeah, money talks and I, I can understand why some of these managers, um, I mean, you could argue that his stock has never been higher. I think it was a quite a similar situation to Vincent Company last summer when he got promoted with Burnley. He was being linked mm-hmm. with some top jobs. And now, all right, he's taken Burnley back down. That's the other way it could go. He could, Kieran McKenna could take it well, back down. He's off and to he's, Bayern Munich, Dan. He's off to Bayern. That's what I was going to say. He's going to caveat that. Yeah, he's still going to link with the Bayern jobs. So maybe. Yeah, maybe no, I, yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, but I think I think maybe McKenna's a well. He's he's I think he's a better manager than yeah, Vincent Company that. as well. Um, and yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if if I was Kieran McKenna, I'd just I'd just sit out for another season. But like I said, you, you can understand why these managers' heads get turned with the money involved. Yeah, I mean it's the obvious example to draw, isn't it? It's quite a similar situation to Burnley last season, but yeah, we'll see. The other one that's catching my eye in this relegation market, Sam, is Brighton and Hove Albion. In the relegation market? In the relegation market. That is bold. That, uh, yeah, it is. What are they? What price the 20, are they? 20 to 1 or 21.0. 20 to 1, okay. Yeah, I that's just, bold. I've got a, I've got a feeling. It's, it's, it's vibe time of the season, general <laughs> vibes, which isn't the best way to go about it usually, but I've just... I've got a, I don't know, I've got a sense, I've got a sense tingling about them. Okay. It's, I don't know, it's a kind of thing where you look at clubs like Swansea City, you look at uh, Stoke, look at Leicester. Mm -hmm. These are, it was another one, another example I had, but all of these clubs have come up kind of established themselves in the Premier League. Burnley was the other one. They've established themselves in the Premier League, certain way of doing things. And they've just kind of plateaued. Many of them have gone into Europe and then just sort of drifted a little bit. Mm-hmm. I find when you hit season five, season six, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of bit of soul searching going on. Yeah, there's there's previous there. I think the the difference that we've got at Brighton is um, like their recruitment's just so good. So like it has been, but every probably... player they sign is a gamble, and there's no guarantee that these gambles are going to pay off. There's no guarantees. I mean, looking at this squad now, there's no. You know, Caicedo was exceptional. McAllister mm-hmm. was exceptional. How many more gems can they find? They've got one in Evan Ferguson, I'm yeah. sure, but the, the luck's going to run out eventually. Maybe, but if in my eyes, I would say that's probably the one area which they probably won't won't falter in. But obviously, they've got to get a manager in now, so it's not that difficult to make a wrong managerial decision. And then from that, obviously, form and uh, individual players' form comes into question too. So potentially, potentially. I'm not saying I'm backing it. And if they get Kieran <laughs> McKenna in as manager, then everything will be, everything will be to, okay at Brighton. Yeah. But I'm just, I'm keeping an eye on them in the next couple of years. I'm not, keeping an eye on, obviously, the market's on out. Yeah, which is just, you know, the season's just finished. But anything to do with Palace and Bournemouth, getting involved in top half yep top seven if you're feeling a bit braver like i really really like the thought of them building on both building on last season last season's campaign and and if palace keep elise as a mateta which is going to be difficult if they keep them and have them fit all season there's no reason why they can't be comfortable top half so yeah, that's one to look out for, I think. Yeah, definitely. Those, those markets usually won't come out until a couple of weeks before the mm. season. The points ones I love as well. We'll, we'll, do, a, we'll do a full preview. Close to Absolutely. The right, what else you got? I've got Liga. It was, a, it was an interesting final day in Liga. Brest, who are one of the smallest clubs in the top flight in France, got three comfortable points. They won 3-0, while Lille drew 2-2 to Nice. So that meant that Brest ended up in third, which will see them straight into the Champions League group stages without the need for preliminary qualification rounds. And there was a camera in the breast dressing room after the game. And it's, they've all like got their tops off, like, you know, it's, it's post-match, all, 
all in a row, all got their arms linked and the camera's just panning around to each of them and they're absolutely belting out the Champions League anthem, like <laughs> screaming it. And it's a set of players, clearly, that likely never thought they'd get the chance to do so, featuring the Champions League. And, you know, playing for one of the smallest clubs in the fl- top flight in, cha- in France is not something that's probably on your agenda. So, yeah, they were clearly absolutely buzzing and now they're in the Champions League next season so that's confirmed brilliant and if you look a little bit further down the league Lyon ended the season in the Europa League spots I think it was six um, they had two remarkable runs this season one at the beginning of the campaign when questions of a potential relegation reared its head and then the final 20 games of the season where they've performed exceptionally to transform what looked like a pretty dismal season. And if you take a snapshot of the league from the 10th of December, so I think that's the last 20 games of the season, um, Leon are top of that league with 15 wins in 20 and six points ahead of G, ahead of PSG, sorry, having played one game more. So Crazy. to turn that form on its head, and then to get Europa League as well, yeah, you could see you, the, you could see the players after the final whistle. They were they were thrilled with it. Obviously, everyone wrote them off, and and they've done yeah exceptionally well to get there. So yeah, it was a big final day in Liga in terms of the European spots. Yeah, season of two halves for Leon. I was looking at the stats the other day, and I think they've won one of their first fourteen matches or something. Yeah, in it's the league. terrible, and then they've won fifteen of the last twenty, as you said. It's, yeah. Fair play. Season of two halves for Leon. <laughs> uh, I want to speak on Tony Cruz, who's announced he will be retiring after the European Championships. I mean, mm-hmm. for me, he's been one of my favorite players over the last decade or so. Same. Going back to the 2014 World Cup, playing for Germany. It, he's, he's fantastic. He's fantastic. He's played, I saw a stat. So he's played for Real Madrid in La Liga for 10 seasons now. His lowest average season pass accuracy was 92%. <laughs> that was his that's lowest. The, yeah, that's that's outrageous. It's incredible. I saw a good quote on him as well from another of my former favorite, play, former favorite players, Juan Roman Raquel May. Mm-hmm. He, Raquel May said on Cruz, he can play a match and not even need a shower when he gets home. <laughs> which I just thought was great. Spot on. Yeah, nice. I mean, he's, he's only 34, Sam. Could he keep going? Like the way he's been playing. Well, yeah, I'm sure he could, but this this feels like this feels like something Tony Cruz would do. Like he is even in retirement, like he's in control of you know what's yeah. what's going to happen next. Like he could easily go to Saudi Arabia, MLS, and play another three years. But you know why? Yeah. Why, why would he? He's had the best career, and he's going out at the very top. He's going out after a Euros on home soil and um, look I never want to wish the <laughs> never want to wish the Germans like the best of luck in a, in a major tournament but it would be nice to see him lift silverware in his, in his final kind of foray into the international um, and in that if, international tournament yeah it feels a bit Zidane for me it's like mm-hmm. the way he's going out it's, it's very sort of yeah, as you say, he's in control of his own destiny as he is whenever he has the ball at his feet. I'm not sure if he's going to headbutt someone in the chest, well, though. That that probably It doesn't won't. seem like the sort. Could happen. It, but yeah, no. Somebody just, needs what, to drop the odds. <laughs> one of my, uh, my favourite players too, Dan, and he's, he's one of them where if you're playing with him, you'd be absolutely thrilled to have him in your team because if you're under the cosh, get out of the ball and just give it to Tony Cruz because you know he's going to, you know, he's going you know to calm the the game down and, and find and pick out of whatever pass he needs to. Um, it should, he'd be great to play with and he'd be great to have on your football team as a fan. And I'm, I'm a little bit gutted we've not had him in the Premier League, but yeah, yeah brilliant player. Would have been nice. I, uh, he's been fantastic for Germany as well since coming back to, to the national team in the past couple of months. And uh, yeah, he's one to watch in the Euros in the summer. The other fond farewell for this week looks to be, I don't think it's been officially confirmed yet, but the former Leicester and Chelsea manager, Claudio Ranieri, has announced that he'll be leaving Cagliari at the end of the season and is reportedly set to retire from football, which, yeah, a bit of a sad farewell, but 
he actually started his professional management career with Cagliari back in 1988 and rejoined them halfway through last season, guiding them to promotion to Serie A via the playoffs. And a 2-0 win over Sassuolo on Sunday secured their survival in Italy's top flight for another season. His final match in football looks set to be at home versus Fiorentina on Thursday night of this week. Brilliant. No, yeah, legend of the game, really. Like his his season in um, charge of, well, that season in charge of Leicester in the Premier League is, yeah, that will go down in history, of course. And seems like a really nice bloke as well. So obviously wish him all the best in, in retirement. Yeah, get Andrea Bocelli on the blower. <laughs> get, belt get out Ness and Dorma. Yeah, get him there on the weekend. That feels yeah. only right. Yeah, fantastic. Let's move on to the second half of the show and have a look at some of Sam's bets for this week. But before we do that, let's go back to the results from last weekend. And Sam, three wins out of four. Let's start off with the game in the playoffs. You went for over sh- over on shots for Kyle Bartley for West Brom. You went for you went uh, three quarters of a unit on over zero point five shots at two point two five, which came in. And you also put a quarter of a unit on over one point five shots at 8.0 which lost you only had one shot in that playoff semi-final yeah I always think it's worth if if you really like a shot's angle like that I always think it's worth sprinkling a little bit on the higher line and on, honestly I didn't actually watch the game because I was away um, at the weekend but I've I got a few messages through saying that he's definitely had two shots but Opta weren't playing ball so they've paid out on one shot and that is just you know it's just one of those things yeah um but yeah, so they Southampton went ahead in the game. Um, like we said, that would be our best port of call. So that happened. And um, I think Carl Bartley had a shot in the 60-something minute. Um, so that came in at 2.25. That was a good price. Um, and the other bet of the week, Dan, was... Two bets. Um, Crystal Palace two, versus over, Aston Villa. Over in Crystal Palace. And that couldn't have been more comfortable. Again, I didn't watch the <laughs> game, but I was... Uh, I had the... I had the notifications coming through on my phone and I was getting a bit giddy. And yeah, I mean, it was never in doubt, was it? Villa clearly on the booze all week, not interested in the final game of the season. And it's a, it was a little bit different for Crystal Palace. They were in front of their own fans. They got a team there like fully in form and in, and in good shape, fit as well, because a lot of their main players haven't played the bulk of the season and fighting for a place in their um, respective Euro squad. So yeah, like we said, it was always going to be a bit different over there. And for the bet builder as well, we had, well, we had Palace win in one bet at 1.83 and we had Palace win and over, or and to have the most shots in the other bet builder at 2.75 and and that come in as well. So Yeah, Palace had 16 shots to Aston Villa's nine, of course, five goals as well for Palace. And I think they had another one ruled out as well, didn't they? They are ruled one out. So, yeah, good win, comfortable, and game went exactly as we hoped it would. That's a good week. That's seven out of eight of the pod's most recent bets over the the last three shows. So, it'd be nice to carry that on. Um, Chelsea, a late season surge reminiscent of Mauricio Pochettino's Chelsea. Let's hope it doesn't end the same. <laughs> yeah, let's. That would be uh, unfortunate. Great. Unfortunately, Sam will not be joining us next week. As he's been fine. Uh, let's move on with your first bet this week, which is for the FA Cup final on Saturday. Yes, so heading to Wembley, um, Man City versus Man United, going for a bet builder. Man City and under 4.5 goals, that's 1.83 on bet365. Um, if you want a little bit bigger price, you could go for obviously under 3.5 goals. I think that's probably around 2.3, 2.4. Um, so this is the exact bet we went for on the podcast in the most recent head-to-head in the Premier League. That ended 3-1 to Manchester City, but did look a little rocky when Rashford cannoned in a shot from about 35 yards early on in the game. But we said then how that forced Man United to sit back even more and soak up pressure, and that really aided the under 4.5 goals pick in the bet builder. Um, and if you look at recent weeks, United have beaten Brighton and Newcastle on the bounce to cap off a season of underperformance, and that looks really good on the face of it. 
Um, but they've also afforded a fair few chances to either side in those games. And I'm not quite sure how they've ended up with six points there. So they lost the expected goals battle in both. And if you do that against Manchester City on the weekend, it's game over. And there's only one place in Manchester that FA Cup is heading. And last season, we've actually got previous to look at from only a year ago so this was the FA Cup final last year that ended 2-1 to Manchester City and since then the two head-to-heads this season reads as 3-0 and 3-1 to City respectively and City in under 4.5 goals has actually landed in four of the last four recent head-to-heads and if you're looking at yeah go on just jump in there sorry just uh, a stat that blew my mind when was the last time that two teams faced each other in consecutive FA Cup finals for I can't recall. You can't recall. You didn't watch it. It was uh, it was in eighteen eighty five. Oh, I did. Yeah, you missed it. You're you out that day, were you? Missed that one. Yeah. Yeah, it must have been. It was uh, Blackburn Rovers versus the Scottish side Queens Park. Right. Okay. Yeah, the only Scottish side to make the FA Cup final. I think there was a ruling from the Scottish FA a couple of years later that banned Scottish teams from the competition. But yeah, wow. there you go. Didn't okay. know that. Carry on. Right. Yeah. So looking at the under 4.5 goals section of the bet, that has also paid out in 17 of the last 20 years worth of FA Cup finals. A a large chunk of them, obviously, at Wembley, a ground that doesn't exactly scream goals in FA Cup finals. You had City 6-0 against Watford. That was one of the occasions that under 4.5 goals didn't materialise. And also that memorable Liverpool versus West Ham, 3-3 draw where Gerrard hit a last-minute screamer, taking it into extra time. And the third one was Arsenal versus Hull in 2014 when Aaron Ramsey got a winner in injury time with the game levelled at 2-2. So there's previous here for maybe FA Cup finals going under the goal line. Um, so that's on our side. And we've got Lissandro Martinez back as well, which is very important to United. And it breaks up that Casemiro and Johnny Evans centre-back partnership, which I'm positive that no United fan ever wants to see again now that the season comes to a close. So, yeah, my bet here, Dan, is for United to be competitive enough and avoid a hammering in you know, a showpiece final fixture, but City to be too strong in the end. And the main concern is obviously them handing United a lesson, of course, but let's just hope United are on it enough to limit a flurry of City goals, which I think they've got in them in in a game of this magnitude. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say they've got their act together, United, but they were, there was some improvement in the last couple of games. Yeah, there was. But looking a little more broadly, I went back and looked at their XGA for their last 12 Premier League games, Sam, Manchester United. Yeah. And they had an average expected goals against of 2.42 in each of their last 12 Premier League games. It's they, not good, is it? It's not good at all. Uh, they're sweating off fitness for a few players, while some others have only just returned from injury. Are you worried the City could just blow them away? Yeah, no, of course. That's like when you when you enter a City game with a selection and you've got under any kind of line. Yeah, that that's going to leave you sweating a little bit. I just feel like it's with, with the game, with it being an FA Cup final, with it being at Wembley, with the likelihood of both teams entering it, with um, you know a bit of apprehension and maybe feeling each other out for periods of the first half, then I just feel like that five goal line may never come and. Like I said, it's landed in a lot of FA Cup finals and it's landed in this head-to-head in all four of the last recent games. So I think it's got a good chance. And if you were to take City win and over 1.5 goals, which was maybe the other um, selection you could have gone for, I think that comes out at about 1.44 or something. So obviously not something that we're interested in. So the underline looks looks to be the right player, I think. And just hopefully... United can turn up and, and keep City at bay for, for large periods. Yeah, um, I like the unders as well. I'd definitely be more inclined to go for the under 4.5 than over 1.5. Don't like that at all mm-hmm. at those odds. Yeah, you're right. Under under 3.5 would have come in at 2.37. Okay. So that's that's not too bad, but yeah, I'd, no, I'd, I'd lean to be a bit more pragmatic, I think. Yeah, you're rubbing off on me here. I like this sort of <laughs> more conservative approach. City, I think, will become the first Manchester side 
to win consecutive FA Cups if they were to do it after that victory last season. And yeah, don't doubt that they're going to do it. Let's move on to your other tip, which is for the other big game at Wembley this weekend, the Championship Playoff Final. Yeah, and I'm going to be honest, and I wanted to take a bet in this game, but I'm not fully sold on this selection being a winner. Like, I don't bound into this. Selling it, man. Really selling it in the first sentence, yeah. I don't bound (laughs) into this with the same conviction as the the previous Manchester City bet. But going off the prices is one that that does stand out from the fixture. The bookmakers have leads at 2.30 favourites against Southampton at 3.10. And I'm not overly surprised at that, to be honest, but I'd personally have it closer towards a a pick'em. And the Asian handicap line is on the 0.25 line. And again, I'd have that at 0.0. So... Of course, it's Southampton with a plus 0.25 advantage at 1.89. That's going to be my bet. Um, so that's, yeah, that's where I'll be heading. And if it was the other way around and Leeds was the plus 0.25 line, I'd, I'd be backing them. So that's why I say, you know, this is not my most confident selection, but we've got to be governed by the prices in this game. And and I think the sides are too evenly matched for one to have that much uh, of an advantage on the on the Asian lines. And the argument probably to be back in Leeds would be that they have the superior firepower and they are blessed at championship level. They they are dangerous across that front line. Somerville and Gnonto on either wing with Dan James leaving the bench and running at weary legs. Like that's a scary thought for any Saints fan heading to Wembley, as is Joe Perot in the middle and he's got an eye for go and he's looking more at home in a lead shirt as the season progresses. But for me, in the likes of Adam Armstrong, Che Adams, Stuart Armstrong, um, backed up by David Brooks, Flynn Downs, Adozi, Ryan Fraser, etc. That's that's some lineup too. And um, for some reason, I, I I don't really know why, but I just think I've got more faith in Russell Martin to get one over on Leeds here, like he's done so in both league games this season, with a two-one away win at Ellen Road, capping off the the season in the final game, and the ever a three-one win down south in September. I just think there's a case here for Leeds not to be such strong favourites. So that plus zero point two five Asian handicap at a match where the draw is a live runner with a side capable and with recent history suggesting they can outfox the other. It's not a bad way to go. And I also wouldn't put anyone off the draw at 3.25 um, also. So, yeah, I'd, I'd like to side with with Southampton at the prices and on the Asian lines, but it's not my most confident bet I've, I've had on the podcast because it probably could just, go either way. Yeah, probably just half a unit for this one then. Yeah I'd, say, yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, that, that probably makes sense. It's, yeah, like I said, not, not my most confident, but on the prices, yeah, it's, it's, that's the way I'll go. Yeah, slim pickings at this time of the season. So I went back and looked at some of the, the history of the EFL playoffs, really, which they were introduced in 1987. And since then, 107 finals have been played, including the League One and League Two games last weekend. So... I've always believed in sort of league position that it influences things. And of those 107 ties, 40 of them were won by the teams that finished highest in the league that season. So in the championship, okay. it's teams that finish in third and league two is teams that finish in mm-hmm. fourth. That's a win rate of 37.38%. Leeds finished in third uh, on that data as well. Teams that qualified second, third and fourth had roughly 20% win rate overall. So it's certainly in in your interest in history that the teams that finish in third usually win the playoffs, which, you know, makes sense. Over the league season, they're going to be the best teams. But yeah, Lee's actually finished in third in this championship season. So do you read anything into history and data like that? Uh, not really, Dan. Maybe oh, I should. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. Sorry, mate. Agents. But yeah, no, n- not really. Like, I, I really like to just focus on the game at hand. And um, yeah, I, I suppose you asked me something similar the other day about kind of uh, like specific matches in history and and whether you look into it too much. And probably not. Maybe if it's a derby, like I said, but. Yeah, in in the playoff finals, really just like to focus on maybe the matchup of either team, what players are available and inform manager versus manager. How did the two head-to-heads in the season, how did they go? I think that's important. Um, 
maybe what's the record like between the managers um but yeah no not <clears throat> i don't really go too too far into it in terms of historical data and stuff but um yeah more so on like form momentum is you know that's probably the buzzword at the minute which i know some people dislike but it's you know it's there and it's real and and i think that mixed with form and um recent head-to-heads for the playoff finals i think that's that's the way i lean i think it, it's more the only major conclusion you can draw from it is that the best team usually wins and mm. the best team usually finishes higher in the league i think that's the, the only major thing you can draw from that uh, the teams that finish in sixth do generally have a better record than the teams that finish in fifth and fourth, which is interesting. Okay. But that is interesting, it, yeah. Again, the teams that finish in sixth would, would have played the teams that finish in third mm-hmm. in the semi final, so they would have knocked out the strongest team by that point. So it's probably just a good. No, that's a interesting. Case of I, wonder, yeah. I wonder if that's got anything to do with like I don't know. If you finish in sixth, maybe you've you've had a late run and you're just squeezing in. Maybe that could be it. But also, I suppose it could be teams on a poor run dropping down to six off yeah i suppose i'd need to look into that but yeah it's interesting yeah i mean i wanted to dig into the success of teams that finish in six in the playoffs and qualify through the playoffs and how they got on in the premier league mm. the next season because i think there's been a few cases where teams have just rocked up in six from the playoffs finished six in the league and then done all right in the premier league but yeah yeah I'll di- well, that's off topic i'll uh, i'll dig into that in the summer probably so, yeah, Sam's bet, Southampton plus a quarter of a goal in the Asian handicap market as they take on Leeds in the championship playoff final on Sunday? Or is it Monday? Mm, it's on the weekend. Is it On the weekend. <laughs> it's on the weekend, like on Sunday. Should I have a quick look? Probably should give should people the correct before, really. information. It's at three o'clock on Sunday. On Sunday. The 26th of May. Fantastic. The, second, uh, the first tip was in the FA Cup final on Saturday, Manchester City versus Manchester United. Sam has gone for City to win the match and under 4.5 goals. That's a 1.83. Remember to select City to win the match in 90 minutes and not City to lift the title because those will bring the odds. That'll bring the odds way down. Happy with them this week? Full, full unit on the City game. Sorry, just say yep. full unit on the City game, half a unit on the playoff final. Yep, correct. Yeah, happy with them. Fantastic. If, as ever, if you are going to be using any of the bets from today's show, then please gamble responsibly, only betting what you could afford to lose. And if you have any time, please leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or YouTube or wherever else you want to listen to the show. We'll leave it there. Thanks to Sam Ingram. Thank you very much. And thank you from me. We'll be back next week. 